before every innovation sees the light of day and every robot learns on its own before every automobile safely drives itself and every rocket ship reaches the stars before every product is printed out of thin air and every digital twin prevents a tragedy before every baby takes her first breath and every virtual reality becomes reality before every student has the world at their fingertips and every patient gets his sight back before all this can become real there is a designer an entrepreneur an engineer a student a scientist a visionary tirelessly working to create a better world using the most powerful the most pervasive simulation technology on the planet. Before every product delivers on its promise, there is ANSYS. Powering our homes, innovating new ways to fly, cooling our world, and even drying our hair. In almost every facet of our lives, Turbo machinery truly makes the world go round. So how do we improve technology that is already proven? How do we generate more energy with every turn of the blade? When failure is not an option, how do we guarantee reliability? How do we get to the next level? These engines must use less power, operate longer, create less noise, and produce fewer emissions. Turbines must be more reliable under a wider range of conditions. They must be more connected, lighter, and heat resistant. They must withstand more cycles than ever before. This demands new thinking and new solutions as engineers are being called upon to squeeze every ounce of innovation out of these amazing machines. The answer is simulation, and the proof is ANSYS. Our turbo machinery solutions optimize more than product design and performance. ANSYS simulations provide for IoT connectivity, for digital twins that manage operational costs and reliability over time, for additive manufacturing to build parts on demand from materials and shapes never thought possible. Advances in turbo machinery will continue to make the world go round. But before these engines break new records in efficiency or carry us to faraway destinations, before the next generation of turbo machinery is created, there is ANSYS. Hello and welcome to the ET Energy World Virtual Summit on Accelerating Innovation, Cost Reduction and Reliability of Electrical Equipment, powered by ANSYS. I'm Annie, your host for the day. Currently, about 90% of domestic manufacturing of electric equipment in India is done by small and mid-sized enterprises. Innovation in product development can help electric equipment industries in managing the product design complexity, quality, reliability, cost and time to market pressure, thus helping them build competitive advantage. The focus of today's event will be on technological changes in product uh, technological uh, challenges in product development and how simulation driven design development can help in addressing them efficiently and accurately to deliver high business benefit. This virtual summit is a collaborative effort supported by an ecosystem of partners and I would like to take a moment to thank our Powered by Partner. Now without further ado I would like to invite Nikhil Patak, Vice President Central Offer Marketing and Business Development, Shanaida Electric India, for a keynote talk. Over to you, Mr. Patel. Platform is on yours. 
Hello, everyone, and uh, I hope all of you are doing well, and uh, welcome to this session. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about what defines the future roadmap for the electric industry, uh, how the new electric world is shaping up, and how together we can help to make uh, this world more sustainable and resilient, not for today, but also for the generations to come. And as you know, uh, sustainability uh, is in the top of the agenda for all the progressive nation. So among all the bad things, what we keep hearing about uh, COVID-19, uh, the world has an unprecedented challenges which we faced. A Couple of good things I would like to highlight. In 2020, uh, the energy consumption reduced globally uh, to the tune of approximately uh, 6%, so negative 6% on, on reduction in energy trend, uh, consumption, and um, uh, the emission, the carbon emission got reduced by 8% approximately, so it's negative 8%. But this good news is because of the bad thing, and uh, that's not uh, the right way of getting a good news, obviously, for all of us, right? Um, so, uh, uh, certainly, we need to think uh, how can we do this in a right manner. If you look at uh, uh, the source of energy, there are multiple sources of energy, but today's 80% uh, of the carbon emission happens because of the energy production, energy manufacturing, and that's the biggest source which contributes to uh, carbon emission. The second, uh, the way we manage our energy, 60% uh, of our processes, our method uh, is not really very efficient. So there is a very high level of inefficiency that uh, we actually today live with uh, while managing energy. And of course, uh, one of the biggest cause for the carbon emission as, as, as you can see over here. Now uh, we have kind of signed up into the global uh, Paris Accord. Uh, the, the world is trying to uh, manage the climate change, this climate crisis. Actually, uh, COVID-19 has brought a very defining moment uh, for our society at large. Uh, it, is, it is telling us again and again that we need to be thinking about the world which should be more resilient uh, even than what we thought. And of course, the sustainability is uh, on, on the top of the uh, priority. So what we can do, I think we need to go back and think about our relationship with energy, our relationship, how do we manage energy, and then how can we make this world more sustainable. As I said earlier, we don't want another COVID for uh, reducing the carbon emission. We don't want another COVID for the less uh, uh, power consumption or energy consumption. That's certainly not the way and no one wish to do. So we have to act and we need to do that. Now, uh, when we look at the source of energy today, 20% uh, contribution or a proportion of electric city in, is there into the global um, energy consumption. Um, a rest is being managed by uh, fossil fuel and heat and transport. Uh, good news is that uh, electric city today is the most efficient form of energy. And the contribution today from 20% is going to go up to 40% by 2040. And people who are all engaged of, um, in this electric world, managing electricity, certainly that's one trend which is telling us that there is a huge opportunity. And this trend is something which all of us would like to welcome and really contribute to. Second important thing is about renewables. 6% uh, today contribution, and that's also expected to grow multifold by 6x. And we expect that that also would have 40% renewable. So good news about electricity contribution in overall energy landscape. And another one is the renewable gaining uh, more share into an overall um, electricity domain. And both these things are certainly, I would see as an opportunity. And when we see an opportunity, we start thinking about how can we encourage the opportunity? And that's the way we, we see this uh, going forward. 
and uh, we, we really need to start thinking that how can uh, we um, uh, kind of sync up the grid with the endpoint consumption, what we call at the age, uh, when we talk about the microgrid and the energy management system, not only in large building, not only in the manufacturing facility, but also uh, into, into the home. Right. Uh, so that's something which uh, I would certainly like to highlight the increasing need of uh, what, what we see today. Now, what we call uh, a new electric world, uh, a new electric world is going to be a combination of all electric world and all digital world. What we mean by all electric world is about more renewable, more electric city due to urbanization, uh, power hungry data centers. Uh, we are talking about uh, more storage, uh, more availability, uh, more DC and AC. Uh, and as I said, energy is the most efficient uh, form of energy, and that's coupled by all digital world. More data, more software to manage more data, uh, and certainly more analytics coming out of more software. Uh, and then uh, uh, certainly more reliable power is the wish of everyone uh, living on this planet. Uh, that can happen coupled with uh, more efficiency. So all electric world and all digital world combined is the new electric world. And we need to leverage the latest trend and the energy shift which is happening across the globe and India pretty much part of it uh, to kind of encourage the opportunity new electric world, be a force, uh, a recommended force uh, uh, where we, we are contributing with everyone else to change uh, this particular landscape into uh, the new electric world. And uh, India specific, so India is not behind and uh, uh, what uh, we see um, at Schneider Electric uh, are the two uh, technological disruption uh, which would drive growth in next five years. Uh, one is uh, energy transition, right? It's almost 1.5 trillion uh, Indian uh, rupees is being invested. It's a 4% of um, gross capital uh, uh, formation uh, uh, towards energy efficiency initiative by government. And that talks about a huge opportunity, huge uh, initiative. Uh, the government is trying to propel uh, and uh, asking everyone to join hands. So that's some kind of an investment which is going for energy efficiency. Uh, also, um, the energy demand is, is going to be almost um, uh, double, uh, like from almost 2x or 2.4x, I would say, uh, due to various reasons, and urbanization is one of them. Uh, so, uh, electrifying the economy, uh, more and more opportunity to meet this energy demand uh, uh, through, BE, through, through uh, uh, electricity, uh, a most efficient form of um, energy uh, which we uh, which we leverage and then the renewable uh, close to 150 percent growth is what we see today uh, and that's the way we also attempt to uh, contribute in decarbonization because decarbonization is at so critical when we talk about uh, sustainability and resiliency on the other side uh, the digital transformation uh, it's it's about uh, IoT and IoT is about connected devices and it's not over mobile phone or a laptop or iPad, but connected devices are on the right on the shop floor. The connected device is uh, 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 is automobile, uh, connected devices in railways uh, everywhere. And this IoT and IoT uh, uh, is really uh, going to uh, kind of really consume so much of data and that has to happen through the connected device. Almost 17 x is the growth which uh, we see uh, likely to happen, 0.3 billion connected device in 2018. Uh, as, per, as per McKinsey, it will go to almost 5 billion connected devices by uh, 2022. And that's a phenomenal growth. And that's something which is going to happen. It's happening. Uh, actually, uh, these estimates are revised um, uh, every year. And then the way we see the proliferation of uh, the connected devices uh, is, is happening. Uh, with connected device 5G, I think all of us are waiting anxiously for 5G and much is being talked and read about it. Uh, so I will, I will not really uh, get into it. But once again, when you look at 5G, um, uh, whenever it becomes a reality and a lot of progress is happening by the telco companies uh, from an electric 
uh, perspective, uh, once again, uh, we, they really need a very uh, reliable uh, infrastructure uh, at all the remote places. They need a connected infrastructure, so we see a good opportunity there uh, to be part of this whole uh, 5G, 5G rollout for the electrical company. And then uh, it's about uh, uh, big data. Uh, uh, India's GDP uh, is uh, expected to contribute more and more from digital sector, right? Uh, from five, four percent, it will go to around around eight percent or seven percent in 2018. We we, we expect it to uh, really uh, accelerate, leapfrog. So a huge. Uh, dependency um, on um, you know, digital sector, which would definitely come up, and we are seeing that uh, happening. So now, uh, uh, energy transition coupled with uh, digital, and that's the integration which is going to really act as a catalyst uh, when we talk about uh, our uh, new electric world. Uh, energy coupled with automation, driving efficiency, uh, we are talking about digital and data, uh, big data, AI, actionable intelligence, which is driving from endpoint to cloud. Uh, we are seeing customer who are not only asking only to design and build their infrastructure, but they're also looking at not only design and build, but also to operate and maintain, operate and manage, right? And then uh, with this connected world where everything is going to get connected, uh, we are not only looking at one site management, we are also looking at one site management to whole company management. So this is from a customer perspective where you can see that uh, we are really uh, uh, getting a, a, a segue into my next slide that what we need to do um, in, in, in our industry, right? So when we look at COVID-19, once again, we don't want to like to refer it to it, but we have seen that those uh, organization who has adopted automation and yet really progress well, they were more resilient. And that only talks about uh, more and more automation requirement. Uh, we talk about a more green world. Uh, we are talking about efficiency. So uh, certainly uh, the integrations of uh, renewable grid, uh, more resilient grid, um, a power quality, uh, we are talking about self-healing grid and self-healing system. So grid automation, digitization, uh, and the sustainable uh, and more efficient uh, uh, power management system. I think this is something which is going to drive our innovation roadmap, which is still driving innovation roadmap. Most importantly is a collaboration between government, uh, regulator, utilities, uh, technology provider company, which could be third party company because one, may, may one company may not have an all everything available in the ecosystem. So collaboration is key over here. So technology provider are important and consumer. So uh, across the value chain in this ecosystem, a real good collaboration is so critical uh, to, to drive and make the new electric world more efficiency. And then um, uh, we have a, a lot of government initiative in which uh, are talking about uh, reliable power, uh, one nation, one grid, one nation, one frequency. Uh, and, and that's, that's once again, uh, very heartening to see. So uh, when we talk about innovation, uh, it's going to be green. The design full philosophy uh, has to be easy to use. Um, uh, we are talking about hybrid, hybrid electrical system and uh, DC is coming. Once again, you'll see more and more DC, right? Uh, so increased use of power, I think, and digital by default it's it's not about choice digital is default and our innovation roadmap has to go in that direction where we talk about all digital world and help this world to be more digital from electrical industry perspective so here a uh, very quick uh, uh, perspective i'd like to give at schneider lake we call eco structure uh, our response to sustainability resiliency where we say a uh, connected product is the bottom layer and then we go to the edge control and then go and 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 and, and have an analytics and software um, uh, a layer there. Uh, so power and process uh, combined, uh, ecostructure for buildings, ecostructure for industry of the future, uh, for greed and plant. Uh, important part here, once again, when we get into innovation because it's all connected, uh, cybersecurity is one of the most critical and most important aspect. And that's something which has to be the core of anything what we are going to be innovating uh, as, as, as a part of our connected product. So uh, cybersecurity is so important. And once again, we talk about innovation and R&D, I think we've got to be looking at that. Atmanirbhar Bharat, I think 
is so good and all of us need to contribute and it's so encouraging for the Indian industry uh, to really contribute more and more self-reliant. This is what we do and in, in our part of Atmanirbhar, uh, providing access to energy of more than a million households. Uh, uh, we are there, uh, 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 top refineries, uh, we are contributing in digital and smart India. Uh, green and safe India. We have an R&D here right in India, in Bangalore, uh, with more than 1,500 people working, and they are not only working for Atmanirbhar Bharat, but the technology is getting outside uh, India also. So I think India today is capable of uh, uh, having a, a very strong uh, innovation uh, approach uh, and uh, very, very frugal engineering, but our technology innovation is also getting outside and I think that's heartening for all of us to know. It's available right here, here in India. So just to wrap up now, uh, we talked about uh, sustainability, uh, we talk about resiliency, we see the energy transition moving to help resiliency and a uh, 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 sustainable world, uh, we can really contribute. It's about new electric world, uh, more digital. We really can contribute. We have a huge opportunity over there. And India is poised, the India electric industry is poised to kind of really leverage this particular trend and contribute uh, to the fullest. Uh, uh, let's, once again, India is among the progressive nation where sustainability is top of the agenda, and we see this new electric world moving into that direction, and it's not going to be an option, but we've got to do that. With that, thank you so much uh, for your patience and listening out. Hope this discussion uh, uh, would have helped uh, putting a segue into the next discussion, and thank you again, E.T., uh, for providing this opportunity. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Parthas, for an engaging session. We'll move on to our next session. We now have our NSYS executive presentation on transforming product development for electrical equipment using simulation by Amit Agarwal, Director, Technical India, Asian, and ANZ NSYS. Over to you, Mr. Agarwal. Thank you, Annie. Thanks for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, we heard from Mr. Parthas about growing importance of electric power technology trends in the area of IoT connected devices, AIML, end to end design development of electrical equipment. Uh, we heard about indigenous design, eco friendly product, self reliance. I'm going to share ANSYS' view of the role of simulation in transforming product design development for electrical equipment. So, this talk is in two sections. Um, the first section, I'll uh, go through a brief introduction of ANSYS and uh, solutions for electrical equipment and then move to a section on challenges faced by electric equipment industry role of simulation highlighting through various case studies with that a uh, few words about ansys ansys as many of you know uh, is not new to simulation we have uh, been committed to engineering simulation for past 50 years we started our journey with structural mechanics all the way to fluid dynamics to electromagnetics optics and over the last past decade, we have expanded to embedded software systems and most recently digital machine engineering. We have been CAD neutral, PLM neutral company with strong focus on customer satisfaction. While we serve multiple industries, electrical equipments have been the first area for us at Ansys. Our mission, as you see, is to empower our customers as you to design and deliver transformation products. Today is the age of transformation products and uh, the improvements are not needed marginally but by order of magnitude and we believe uh, our mission is to enable our customers to make this happen well uh, looking at solutions specific to electrical equipment we offer solutions from components to subsystems and system level covering wide range of equipments including but not limited to transformers generators switch gears motors actuators sensors and so on from physics point of view, our solutions help with addressing problems related to stress, vibrations, noise, fatigue, failure from a structural point of view, problems related to heating, pressure drop from fluids, problems related to sizing, NBH, EMI, EMC from electromechanical point of view. Overall, our solutions help with reliability of electrical equipments, uh, starting with electrical reliability, thermal reliability, and last but not the least, the structural language, as all of these are interdependent. From consumer appliances point of view, there is growing interest in perceived quality, uh, where our optic solutions are limited very really heavily. Last but not the least, the role of simulation today is limited not just to retail design, but it is expanding upstream to concept design, functional design, and downstream 
in manufacturing and operations maintenance for high value industrial assets for reducing any unplanned downtime. And that is a growing area of focus for us. So uh, we, I, we spoke about technology. Let's look at the other dimension. Talent is just another crucial element for successful deployment of simulation. We at ANSYS have invested in various programs to help spread awareness and adoption of engineering simulation in both teaching and research, right from undergraduate to postgraduate and doctorate students. There are over 2,750 universities using ANSYS for both teaching and research, and with over 635 universities having multi physics campus wide applications. There are also freely available learning forums uh, for students. And last year, we launched ANSYS innovation courses on fundamentals of structural mechanics, fluid dynamics, electromagnetics for both students and professionals. Professionals also importantly because there is a growing demand on, on cross training, learning, relearning. A uh, lot more people are required to uh, learn across mechatronics. And that's where we think we as a company are required to invest in this area. Additionally, there are multiple universities globally for online education, and we are uh, pursuing similar such courses with Indian institutions as well. Moving on, um, startups have been at the forefront of innovation in multiple industries. ANSYS has a well established program to support startups in product design and development with access to simulation tools at high discounted prices. Uh, over 1,000 startups. Uh, including popular Firefly soft aerospace from over 44 countries, including India, have benefited from the same. And uh, we encourage any startups in the audience to reach out uh, for more details. Then let's look at the next dimension. Um, while many engineering companies across both small, medium, and, and large enterprises are embracing cloud to get past hurdle of hardware computing, ANSYS has very rapidly scaled its solutions on cloud, and today majority of our products are available to cloud, supported by Microsoft Azure. With ANSYS providing one-stop solution, customers are able to launch simulations from the desktops without worrying about maintenance of hardware or software. Last but not the least, uh, we spoke about technology with talent, pricing, and hardware. As the complexity of simulation grows, need for continuous training, support, and handholding grows. This is where we invested in one of the largest infrastructure of online training. And a talented pool of engineers with advanced degrees and rich industrial experience to help you uh, in, adopt, in applying simulation to your product design development through the industry. That was the section about, uh, and last but not least, uh, uh, how significant is for ANSYS. ANSYS always had strong commitment for India. Uh, we have been present in India for over 25 years with dedicated teams for global products development consulting in addition to our regional teams serving India, ASEAN and NZ regions for complete portfolio of ANSYS products. We have been serving India through regional offices and uh, partner network. So that was the first uh, section of my talk. Now I'll move to the second section and this is going to focus on challenges faced by electrical equipment industry and role of simulation to various case studies. So the first slide, this is about uh, a survey. 50 and PwC conducted a survey in 2019. CEOs, CTOs, uh, and directors participated in the survey. Quality and cost advantage ranked as highest influences in driving sports. More than 50% of the respondents agreed that focus on these levers is highly important for organizations to drive sport. For the same survey, 58% of the respondents said technology investment product driving R&D innovation is key component of value chain. And by this survey, this survey is a testimony, it's a validation of the change happening in India. That technology advantage is a major contributor for delivering on growth. We all heard about Atmanirvar Bharat. I believe technology advantage is one key element without which it will be very difficult to be uh, Atmanirvar. And already that revolution is underway. Moving on, small and medium enterprises have also accepted that innovation plays an important role in building competitive advantage. Here is a national innovation survey done in 2014, which reveals innovation has helped small and medium enterprises to deliver on increased range of goods, new market entries, increased market share, quality, reduced materials, and energy cost. In this process of making uh, gains from innovation, ANSYS can help reduce technology investment risk. 
moving quickly um, these are uh, this should not be a surprise cutting across industry not just electrical equipment time to market reducing cycle time and new product uh, in introduction continues to be the key drivers for innovation product development uh, while we see a lot more product rollouts in the consumer appliances some of those elements are applicable to uh, other industries as well very quickly uh, touching on the product development challenges what do these drivers mean for product design and development definitely higher productivity efficiency with lower price yet higher reliability while meeting regulatory compliances are challenges thrown at our product design community many challenges might seem contradictory and require trade offs which in turn require exploring many more product design configurations with alternate materials alternate geometries designs and so on very rapidly and we believe simulation has a big role to play here this is just quickly to validate uh, it is proved to provide a simulation has proven to provide roi in upfront simulation the returns may vary depending on industry and products being developed however the gains shown here are very promising and uh, it is delivered on almost all critical parameters uh, contributing productivity innovation quality now i'll move to uh, the interesting part of case studies uh, which come from very old industry the first uh, case study is from hyundai heavy industries bulgaria with electrical power demand growing rapidly power transformer and that change performance must be continuously improved. Hyundai Heavy Industries used coupled ANSYS multiphysics systems in workbench to evaluate 3D conceptual studies. Simulation helped them to reduce the time and number of prototypes required to develop higher product performing products, reduce time to market, and minimize production cost. Hyundai estimates that engineering costs have been reduced by 3% to 5%, and it hopes to achieve a 10 to 15% cost reduction in the future through multiple simulation. We have more detail um, on each of these case studies. Please feel free to reach out after the talk. We can share these case studies with you. Next success story case study is from Marelli Motors from Italy on motors and generators. The market for electric power generation equipment is growing completely every day, with customers demanding more reliable, yet eco-friendly products at lower cost. And we heard so much about eco-friendly products uh, in, in our earlier talk. Braille Motory uh, meets these demands using um, ANSYS multiphysics simulations to custom design motors and generators to solve challenges in hydropower, cogeneration, oil and gas, civil and commercial marine transport and military applications. Using ANSYS uh, platform to perform multiphysics simulations, They've been able to determine the design which combines the optimal structural integrity, thermal efficiency, and cost reduction. The simulations help, help, help them yield high quality results in 60 to 70 percent less time than the, the legacy simulation products they were using. More recently, they also began using ANSYS Discovery Live to obtain instantaneous simulation results with every on the fly change to a product geometry or operating conditions, thereby reducing design time. Even after the design has been optimized using simulation, the challenge of building the motor or generator most efficiently and effectively remains. This is the most challenging part of engineering workflow because the engineers are trying to optimize, uh, uh, trying to optimize the uh, using simulations. This, because the uh, using simulations, uh, um, it guides the engineering teams to the best manufacturing process in very less time. In summary, Marelli Motors has applied simulation in truly pervasive nature, starting with concept design to detail design to manufacture. And this in turn has helped them to design best components for customized motor generators, become more competitive, and customers have appreciated their increased efficiency, cost reduction, shorter development time, and yet greater reliability. Let me move to the next case study. This is on switch gear. Uh, this is from Lucy Electric UK. Lucy Electric is a leader in secondary power distribution systems for utility, 
industrial commercial applications. In an emergency or when maintenance is required, uh, high voltage, high current electric power must be quickly and safely disconnected. However, simply separating the contacts as in case of a light switch is not sufficient because high current makes the surrounding gas between the separating contacts conducive. This creates an electric arc over which the current continues to flow and current causes additional stresses on the associated bus line. Lucy Electric engineers estimated the electrodynamic forces and applied ANSYS mechanically to optimize the shape, placement, and durability of spatial splitter plates. Using simulation, the company increased the performance of switchgear designs quickly and economically and deliver superior reliable and energy products to market. They use electromagnetic and mechanical simulation to identify arc simulation, arc generation, high stress areas, etc. And could compare many more designs compared to past and reduce cost and test uh, for prototypes. Let me uh, move to the last few case studies. So, this is on robust electric machine design from WEG Motors. WG's engineering team has been aiming to deliver optimal energy efficiency, low operating noise, long bearing life on their new W50 electric line motor. Cooling fan was used to, uh, to cool the heavy duty motor and that was the prime requirement. Flow simulation was done to improve cooling of internal side of heavy motor. Electromechanical simulation was done to verify electromagnetic performance as flow simulation leads to design changes which can impact uh, the electromagnetic performance. Thermal simulation was performed to predict bearing life. All these are interrelated. They increased the simulation effort and were able to reduce the lead time and cost of oil. Very quickly, uh, the next case study on AC drives. This is from Danfoss. Danfoss sought uh, continued innovation of their AC drives with the goal of reducing energy waste. In exploring innovations for their AC drives, Danfoss goes through painstaking process of design, build, text, fix, often four or five or more times, with each iteration consuming six to eight months of work. As a result, the final design for a new drive would stretch time to market to over two years. Through the predictive power of, of simulation, uh, they were able to bring new drives to market in one fourth of the time uh, consumed previously. As their engineers no longer need to wait for physical prototypes to test for reliability, they convert ECAT files into simulation ready models within minutes. Overall, reports indicate both product reliability and customer satisfaction. My next case study is from Randial. And this is about materials. Every material Randial uses has different performance requirements as well as manufacturing and quality standards. Material decisions need to be exhaustive, repeatable, auditable, balancing competing property requirements, uh, which could be from mechanical, thermal, electrical, chemical point of view, is necessary for developing and improving these components. Using ANSYS uh, Granta selector, they rapidly identified new alloys and polymers for new generation of high performance electrical conductors. The time taken to perform a complex material study was reduced to half, making their material experts more productive. Secondly, simultaneously they reduced the risk of restricted materials in their products and exported simulation ready data from their selected hard data set, allowing the simulations to be more relevant and This is the final case study. This is from uh, Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric, as uh, uh, they use one of our tools for uh, simulating simple electrical switch with the aim of reducing cost, time, and streamlining design process. So simulation helped them uh, uh, through design of experiments with material contact and conductor thickness as variables, which helped them to identify cost-effective materials, coatings to be desirable. Them. Finally, they were able to reduce product development time by 30 to 40 percent and cost by approximately 30 percent. That to wrap up, 
We have seen as in earlier case studies, simulation has enabled various companies in electrical equipment industry to gain competitive advantage through innovating faster with much better designs at lower cost and reduced time to market and enhanced reliability. Last but not the least, the ROI over the years has far exceeded the investment. Thank you for listening. Back to you, Andy. Thank you, Mr. Agarwal, for the insightful session. Moving on to the next session, we have a panel discussion on product development challenges in electric equipment. And for this, I would like to invite Sudhir Pal Singh, editor, ET Energy World, to moderate this discussion. Over to you, Sudhir. Thank you, Annie. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very uh, good morning to all of you again. And uh, you know, uh, a very warm welcome on this panel discussion on product development challenges in the, the electrical equipment uh, sector or industry. Uh, with an eminent set of panelists that we have today, uh, including uh, Mr. Hans Raj Mishra, he is the CEO of REIL Electricals. Uh, we have uh, Rajan Kumar Sharma, he is the CMD of uh, SPEL Technologies. We have uh, Mr. Akhil Rahman, the CTO of uh, Hitachi AVB. And finally, Mr. Uh, Shital Kumar Joshi, he is the uh, head of electricals and electronics India and ASEAN at ANSYS. Uh, let me let me begin this discussion by uh, by asking uh, Mr. Hansraj Mishra to uh, to respond to a question on you know uh, R and D objectives. So so what exactly are the business objectives uh, that that you see uh, driving the uh, product development uh, you know as a function in the entire electrical and electronic sector? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, if you uh, see in a very holistic manner, the major uh, change, it is something like a paradigm shift, is going to happen that more and more DC systems are coming into the picture. Maybe because of the basic energy sources are changing from fossil fuel to uh, solar or wind, which are much more uh, uh, aligned with DC systems. It is easy to uh, maintain a storage system directly. In automotive, where IC engines were uh, prevalent and electrical was just an auxiliary part, now electric is going to the main heart of the uh, system and uh, definitely it is a DC system. And uh, the sector which we are into, basically we are into the different type of motors, uh, either DC or AC motors for railways and different equipment we find it is going to be a very big challenge. One challenge is because existing, you have got a, a wider acceptance for AC because it is a, uh, supposed to be very compact and supposed to be uh, high powered. Though the efficiency is always in uh, question, but we never ask that because of DC was supposed to be a little bit outdated or uh, say big runners sort of thing for more than a hundred years. So the fight which is started from the great uh, innovator like Mr. Edison and Mr. Tesla, this, that circle is going to be a complete now. Uh, Tesla uh, could not uh, make it, though he made uh, successfully as an innovation, a business he could not make. Whereas Mr. Edison, uh, he made a good business, though uh, innovation-wise he was not good. I mean, compared to the ACDC issue. So now we see this is going to be a big challenge. The reason is, uh, this uh, decentralized of power generation. See, we, we are looking for small, small grids instead of uh, people are talking a national grid. Yeah, national grid will be there, but it will be a distributed national grid. So maybe every city or every state will have their own grid based on their uh, energy bucket. They say, say uh, places like Tamil Nadu or Gujarat. I think in near future they will uh, uh, they will be totally dependent on wind or solar. Uh, how to uh, look into those type of things and then align them with the current uh, requirement in the field. So this is going to be not only a technological challenge, it is basically more of a, a psychological and acceptance because you have got a whole uh, system already existing, which is based on uh, something not very aligned with DC right now. So uh, there are innovation in, uh, globally happening on uh, high voltage DC system, uh, micro grid system. Now it is a high time that uh, as a society in India, as a government, uh, our government should look into 
for a much longer horizon that what is going to happen say down next 10 years or 15 years so when you talk about 2030 energy is going to be like this bucket will be going to be like this so how the other systems are aligned so i think uh, this is one of the area where uh, we should look forward to a very integrated and very holistic thing just not high tech or just not the digital thing the basic things are going to be changed one thing is decentralization of the thing maybe every community will have their own system so like uh, what we see in pune now uh, every society that means i i mean the housing societies they are thinking can we uh, generate some electricity for our own purpose and then connect to the grid these things are now uh, taking a very uh, rapid shift and in future maybe it happens that this direct solar energy or wind energy it will be put in a system which will store and then finally sell it as a, uh, a swapping of batteries maybe the battery technology will go to such a thing that battery will be available in uh, nearby uh, uh, retail shop so you can go and buy a battery for 3 hours or 5 hours or for 200 km and run your vehicle i mean these are the things which we should look at how to integrate this uh, future with the current status and then go forward yeah thank you okay uh, my next uh, question is for uh, mr rajendra kumar sharma and uh, very nicely put you know the the, the entire objective of rnd uh, by mr mishra uh, mr sharma can you tell us uh, you know what when we are trying to achieve certain business objectives, uh, you know, uh, what are the different types of R&D related challenges that are encountered, uh, you know, when we are trying to realize the larger business objectives, very broadly. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, basically, I would uh, like to slightly elaborate R&D because many times R&D is misunderstood. And if you look at the statistics, uh, world's only 10% R&D is commercialized. That is the reality. And the story in India is no different. Or I can say it. It is worse. <coughs> yeah. So now, uh, what is R&D? What, uh, what I will say, we have to break this R&D into two parts. One is R, other one is D then we can manage it properly and then we can commercialize it because every now and then what we talk we talk about business b2b business to business we talk about um, b2c but we never talk about r2b research to business now how to attain that see the research institutes in india because we uh into capacitor and supercapacitor and energy storage manufacturing and we are almost in touch with uh, jointly associated with more than 22 research institutes in India. We understand the limitation there. We understand the limitation of the market and all that thing. So basically, when you do some research, you are developing some material. Like, for example, you have developed graphene. Now, graphene is a material. OK, it's fine. You have developed. But it will have n number of applications. The development of that application the industry has to come in picture. You just, the industry cannot sit at the bay and we want the technology from the R&D Institute and give us a ready to serve project, ready to serve. Like we are going in the longer, we only have to have our lunch, that's all, no. The research part, the research institute will do their part, they will develop the material, but at the development part, industry has to come in picture. Uh, when the industry wants to commercialize that product and uh, industry support has to be there so there has to be a very close coordination between the research institute and the industry that is the major factor and one more factor needs to be added on to that because every morning we get up and there is a new technology so we cannot just waste time on development development do requires a time and there the role of simulation comes in picture because we want to curtail on time the re before re releasing the product into the real world we need to do it the simulation on the lab level on the this thing and then do the correction like then you don't have to recall the product every now and then okay we have launched some product and now after some time we realize something and we are recalling it so 
that kind of uh, unpleasant scenario needs to be avoided. So basically, the real challenges in research and development going to the business objective, our approach has to be proactive. We should not wait for the problem and then go in search of the solution. Uh, the scenario I will try to uh, explain in a way, like when you talk about research, world 70% of the research on lithium battery is done in India or by Indian. What is the scenario of manufacturing? We don't have any manufacturer. The, even the same case is with the electronics. 80% of the world electronic design is done in India, but hardly 2% is manufactured in India. So the greatest challenge for R&D to commercialize, I will sum it up, industry has to put its right foot forward, uh, join hand with the research institute, identify your product, and work in that direction. This association of academic and commercial culture has to be there. And this association is somewhere midway in the development. Then only a lot of success stories are going to come out. And we have to take that 10% R&D, which is converted to commercialization of business, we have to increase that. So definitely, these are the, my views on challenges of commercialization. Industry has to come forward. Research Institute has to come forward. There has to be a synergy between both the things. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for those uh, great comments. And uh, it's a very important point, you know, there has to be a close coordination between uh, uh, between the industry and the research institute. Uh, that's 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 a lot of food for thought. Uh, my next question is for uh, Mr. Akilo Rehman, and, and that's related to innovation, right? Uh, there is a there is a technological shift which is currently happening um, in the in the electrical equipment design space, right? Uh, how is R and D delivering on on that innovation uh, to achieve the larger uh, product of uh, product objectives? Okay, thank you, Sudhir. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I would say uh, more than shift, it is also extending the products uh, towards, uh, you know, adapting the new technologies, the digital technologies, the new way of uh, measuring the performance and also integrating whether we talk about uh, uh, high voltage DC, we talk about facts, we talk about, uh, you know, the microgrid. Uh, so here, uh, Compared to other domain, each and every product in electrical domain is very important from the point of view of any malfunction, any failure actually can lead to a blackout, for example. Yeah, whether it's a circuit breaker or transformer or a disconnector or uh, uh, you know the automation, the relay, the ID, the you know the the edge computing, what we talk about, you know that's there in you know intelligent electronic device. So uh, here, as the system grows with, uh, as uh, some of the speakers have talked about it, it's going to be systems of systems. Uh, so distributed systems, a lot of distributed uh, you know, uh, energy resources getting connected, and also we are extending the network, the grid, towards the neighboring country, making uh, one uh, you know, world, one sun, one world, and one grid, that kind of concept. So each product has to be actually uh, in addition to its core functionality, which has been there, I mean, as uh, I can tell you that as uh, Hitachi KBB power grids, we have been there in this product development and uh, adapting a lot of tech pioneering technologies since last 130 years, 35 more than that. You know, it has been many a times we are ahead of the time in terms of bringing in the technology. Uh, as Mr. Sharma also talked about, how do you, uh, you know, you may have the technology, but how do you bring that to the market, to the to the user, to the system? Uh, so here, what, how we are trying to adapt is basically we have a lot of technologies, the core technologies, whether it's a switching or transformer or grid automation or integration, HVDC, fax, but also uh, enabling all the products in terms of uh, digitalization having the sensors in that and also having uh, the capability to have uh, edge computing. Let's say take the data uh, from the product asset itself and also uh, from the system, from the processes, um, apply machine learning, artificial intelligence, and uh, 
then uh, improve the performance of the product as i said i said performance so also you know uh, making a model of uh, the product in terms of asset health model which can indicate uh, the health uh, you know healthiness of the product whether it is you know healthy or it is going to fail or maybe so more predictability because in uh, power system we can't have uh, you know surprise the surprise can actually even a small component in the system the high network system with a lot of uh, sensors actuators controllers uh, any any malfunction any you know failure can lead to catastrophe uh, so here what we do is we enable the product in terms of having the sensors very sophisticated sensors uh, correcting the data uh, you know doing the the analytics of that product as well as the process where it is like the power system power flow and uh, applying all the machine learning artificial intelligence uh, algorithms also extending that how it can be also used for blockchain uh, for example application blockchain in the utilities in the power and energy systems uh, also uh, having the digital twin you know the speakers talked about digital twin this has been you know we have been using it uh, since uh, several decades for designing a product optimizing uh, but today that same digital twin the model uh, can be also used uh, in real time to compare uh, its uh, you know design value with the operating value and then see where are where are the problems whether it's a product uh, design problem or it's a system problem uh, which can you know uh, increase the uptime of the product I mean, that, you know, that it can reduce the downtime it can also give you a predictive maintenance kind of uh, scenario where you can predict anything happening in the product and uh, also uh, using different communication technology you know 5g is coming we have the lora one uh, there already so how do you communicate with that product with using all these technologies and uh, taking the data to the cloud as it, i talked about and uh, very important also cyber secure because most of the uh, products the assets the uh, equipment they are now digitally enabled they are communicable although they were there since many decades but they were inside the uh, network the system network utility network but today they are also exposed outside they are connected to the cloud in terms of you know pushing the data to the cloud for analytics and all so how do you make them cyber secure the robustness of the product in terms of even if there is an attack or uh, you know malware infection of the product itself through the through its communication port so how the product can still work sustain it maybe a self healing kind of thing all tolerant kind of product so uh, making them cyber secure and also at the same time uh, how these products for example can be uh, inspected uh, with uh, less downtime i'll give one example uh, so we have large power transformers where uh, you know the any inspection because of any malfunction or any you know uh, failure uh, you need to really open the transformer take out the oil and you know disassemble and do the inspection inside uh, but uh, now we have a technology driver robot we actually used it in, in in india we have started using it so this robot can be sent inside the transformer you don't have to actually take out the oil you don't have to open the transformer fully so it goes inside and then it dives inside the transformer goes around and then you you have the service engineer maintenance you who can who can monitor it from outside also remotely so that way you can reduce the downtime for example you find any anomalies in the so it's called uh, you know t explore it's exploring the transformer inside with the robot so this robot is very robust uh, goes inside the oil transformer oil very thick oil in our high dense oil and also having its light where it, it, it can inspect a lot of components inside failure cracks and all uh, i think it's uh, all about and also for example uh, another thing what we are doing is that how the product uh, model also can be integrated in a virtual augmented reality environment uh, so we have uh, let's say uh, power twin we call it so where you can go through installation you can get uh, you know explore the product even going into the even without going into the site uh, you know the the environment where so you can have that experience and also get the information about the product or asset uh, you know whether it is design value or testing value or its operation value and also the entire 3d model thermal you know a thermal profile everything so i think it's all uh, about how we bring all these new technologies digital technologies digital twin and uh, make the product enable for the new generation of uh, i would say the assets 
it, in terms of asset health management, asset performance management. And we we are doing uh, with with the uh, R and D with innovation, you know, bringing in and also piloting it at SAC. Many of the things I talked about, we have already piloted. We have already we are already using it. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Raiman. Thanks for those comments, and uh, uh, you know, I would say a lot of uh, really good examples uh, that will help us remember a lot of this uh, important uh, information. Uh, my, my next question will be for Mr. Shital Kumar Joshi, and I want to understand uh, again uh, related to the R&D challenges that companies typically face. Uh, what is uh, what is ANSYS overall point of view on uh, the, the Indian uh, innovation challenges which typically are faced by the electrical uh, and companies yeah right thanks uh thanks Shudir. uh this is a uh, quite a nice discussion ongoing uh and then yes i would like to add uh, what we view as a simulation provider what we see the industry challenges uh, in electrical uh, world today electrical equipment world today uh, so this was kind of one of the oldest uh, industry as i kind of as old as kind of generation of electricity, but yet it's transforming many other industry like e-mobility today and industry itself is going transformation. And then some of the things that were mentioned about the smart grid, I think we're talking a lot about that distributed storage, distributed generation, like Mr. Hens uh, mentioned about DC versus AC. I think that's, that's, a, that's also kind of a challenge that's coming up now, delivering quality and consistent power through kind of enhanced decision making. Uh, through automation or IoT or machine learning, uh, I think the accelerating kind of uh, uh, metering uh, infrastructure, you know, advanced metering in infrastructure. These are the kind of I think we see the trends that are happening in the industry. Uh, if I go in more specific, I think I could just kind of recollect what Mr. Nikhil had mentioned uh, that uh, digital and electrical world are getting combined now, and you know, connected components are enabling reducing manpower, making resilient grid predictive and prescriptive maintenance uh, like like you know, some of the seasonal fluctuations uh, you can see the load carrying capacity of your transmission line and you can kind of optimize and use it the best so this this kind of kind of unlimited opportunities are opening up which were not there a few years back uh, uh, but but i think the question would be how do we make more reliable plant models or mathematical models or digital twins uh, that 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 gives a confidence that what we intend to do uh, happens can we rely only on the analytics? Uh, can we phys mix physics and data analytics to get some high quality digital twins? And I think Mr. Rahman also mentioned about kind of reliability of model that, that it should happen that kind of you're designing something but it results in some blackout and all. So so, so I think I, I see this is uh, these are opportunities and these are challenges as well. How do we make more reliable digital infrastructure? And uh, digital twin, digital models can kind of predict uh, downtime and services and and then how do how do we make it maximum use of, use of it now another channel in this uh, in this kind of uh, entire uh, transformation that's happening is how do we make sure our grids that we want to be more resilient smart efficient but they are also secure okay. there are no cyber attacks happening on the grids because we are kind of as I again I mentioned with one of the panelists that we are opening up our grids to make it more efficient make, make it more functional automated but that's also making it more vulnerable. And, and I think ISO 21434 standards, uh, I think those are important, those are going to be challenging. And before just uh, closing, I would just uh, also mention that another innovation challenge that we see is kind of a e-mobility that we all know, I think we, 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 are, we, are, uh, we are prone to see the massive upsurge of energy intake for charging e-vehicle and uh, setting up the infrastructure that's again safe as well as uh, efficient, that's that's going to be a challenge. Uh, thank you for those comments, uh, Mr. Joshi. Uh, let me now turn to uh, Mr. Mishra again, Hansrat Mishra, and ask him, you know, a very important question on uh, two factors, cost and uh, the go-to-market time that companies face. So, um, you know, in your own industry, how are, uh, you know, innovation and design-related challenges uh, impacting the these two things, cost and go-to-market time, as far as your own industry perspective is concerned? So, if you can tell us about that. Uh, see, here, uh, when you look into what Mr. Sarma was uh, pointing, a very, very, very 
uh, eye opening thing that only 10% is finally goes to the manufacturing globally and in indian scenario it, it should be uh, I, i think it is much less than even 5% so the situation is uh, on paper we accept many things or uh, in discussion we accept many things but when it, i mean i am talking about the my sector it is basically uh, equipment like say automobile or uh, mining equipment or marine where this uh, this change will take much more time than uh, rather uh, other systems the reason is these are owned by somebody say a vehicle is owned by somebody the transformer is not owned by somebody most of the cases either it is from government or from some company so there you can think that i am going to invest this much money but when i have got a car and it is say 10 years old and if somebody ask me to switch over to electrical sell this car or uh, dispose it and go for a uh, vehicle which is two times costlier than the basic model so uh, we are basically a cost driven uh, society we are not on paper we may have many things but ultimately it comes to the cost because they, uh, in the pyramid if you see the entire pyramid of the nation the population the bottom uh, part is very important so only 2% or 5% of population may have a global life but uh, when you come to the bottom part and uh, naturally you cannot uh, think something which is beyond uh, totally avoiding the bottom part i mean I'm, i'm telling bottom part means who are using the equipment i'm not telling those who are not using at all so here the important part is to convert it actually we we have taken a program at very small level some of the mining equipment or some uh, off road equipment how to make them uh, understand that the uh, current electrical equipment or current uh, auxiliary equipment needs to change innovative products are available very uh, successful and proven product but when you bring them in the practical there are certain issues like say uh, globally all starter motor all vehicle they have transformed to uh, reduction gear long back maybe 10 years back in india due to the environment temperature dust condition they could not put it even now so the, in a, say a typical sector is a mining sector a coal mining and all where uh, typically even uh, last 20 years we are using uh, dumpers and dozer which are having say 50 ton capacity to maximum 100 ton now global standard is minimum 200 ton and above say volvo scania all are coming to india they have got a base in india but when you go for long term life to them there are issues and those issues are not technical those are basically mostly uh, economical and little bit psychological because for a long time you are habituated in certain type of technology and uh, as a culture we are not very uh, uh, transformational that means uh, we are unable to uh, put a new idea as i told you on paper people may agree the discussion room they may agree finally they will ask what is the cost and what is going to be the disruption with the society or the customer will adopt it other these are the very blurring thing but situation is changing say in pune we have taken a project uh, with some of my friend who, who were working in china two three years back they have come out with a motor which can be put on a normal vehicle i mean two wheeler first we are trying so we are taking some 22 wheeler from people uh, from common uh, population and we are giving a free kit it is costing say 3000 plus battery we just want to see how it works so one side when you have the e vehicle or uh, something a uh, custom built e design we have to think millions of vehicles are there on road what to do with them you cannot describe it we cannot tell them that go and uh, immediately switch over to electrical it is true for other uh, equipment also other vehicles also so uh, these are the issues i mean uh, practical issues and if you can convert a vehicle say a two wheeler with 10000 rupees that is more acceptable to a person than rather than to buy a 50000 or 1 lakh rupees new vehicle so this 10000 rupees not only save the uh, current vehicle it will save the fossil fuel well or I, i'm sorry i'm interrupting you here uh, you know time is a major major constraint for us so if you can be brief okay yeah these are the issues which we are facing from my sector 
Okay, fine. Uh, very, very uh, thought-provoking comments again uh, by Mr. Mishra. Let me turn to Mr. Uh, Sharma, Mr. Kumar Sharma here, and ask him a question on Make in India. Uh, you know, I, and I want to ask you, uh, considering the kind of, uh, you know, the current scenario that we have, is the electrical equipment industry uh, really prepared to, to kind of uh, leverage the, the opportunity that exists if India emerges as a, as a manufacturing hub? Yeah. yeah. Uh, see, uh, uh, when we say make in India, it is not just a slogan. Uh, it is a mission. Mission to take our country into the next revolution industry for like any other country, like in US, the name might be different. It might be smart city in, in initiatives. In Singapore, it may be smart nation. Germany, they have come out with industry four or China made in China. So India make in India. But uh, we have slightly improvised that make in India because it may be misunderstood concept. Only if you want to become a manufacturing hub. That means it should not be mistaken. We will be just doing a sort of a work donkey work without value addition the valuation addition is very important in fact make in india taken up to create in india and that is atmanir bharat and we are learning from our experience like suppose we have got a lot of mobile manufacturers which has erupted in last uh, four five years but if we analyze the value addition i'm sorry to say that it is hardly 20 percent we are making battery packs what is the value addition? Like we are uh, lithium ion battery pack, the value addition is 24%. Out of that 24%, again, we are importing 15%. So effectively, we are just adding our labors to that. So we, when we talk about manufacturing hub, we should not limit ourselves only to doing an assembly job. We have to create, we have to create in India. So basically, uh, has a because this is a coordination between the government and the ministry. So to support that, like Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, have started a unique part for energy storage because the energy sector is the driving force right now for a lot of opportunities. You cannot imagine a life without electricity, and electricity, whether it is offline or offline, we are struggling on to that. So basically, when we talk about storage, only 3% of the energy is stored in the world right now. And India being a founder member for COP21 of Paris Agreement, we have committed for uh, reduction in carbon footprint, reduction in greenhouse energy. So that can be attained only when we focus more on energy storage, focus more on creation of green energy, sustainable energy. So there are a lot of opportunities in that sector. So like in uh, energy storage, I, I will just explain in brief, uh, India wants to start manufacturing of lithium battery. It should not be a cut-based technology. Anything which is uh, valid in US or Norway or China may not be valid in India. So we have to create our own technology. India is a tropical country. We need to understand that whatever batteries which are acceptable in uh, Norway or China may not be acceptable in India due to environmental reason, due to tropical reason. So that is altogether a different topic. The question put up by Mr. Singh is like, what are the opportunities? Definitely energy is driving the opportunities. We have opportunities in smart cities, smart grid, electric mobility, smart chargers. And when we talk about uh, what are the figures, like globally, the equipment industry's uh, reduction is 13% surge is there. The scenario is much encouraging in India. We are 3% more. India require the growth will be 16% as compared to global, which is 13%. So government is doing a lot of investment in distribution sector but definitely uh, apart from distribution sector transmission is also a growth driven industry so uh, for equipment manufacturer there are a lot of opportunities in distribution also in 
lot of government is putting lot of investments so lot of opportunities will be there i will give you example of just uh, electric mobility wherein we are talking about electric mobility and we are struggling on charger so there is lot of charging infrastructure which will be coming out in near future and we have to gear up for that uh, we need to have smart chargers we were like uh, industry around 40 years before electrical equipment industry we were not bothered about power factor then the electrical utility service is told it is a look out of the industry to to the power factor correction okay fine we did that then later on we were facing a lot of harmonics issues are there due to uh, invasion of power electronics again the harmonics controlling part is left on to the load side to the industry now there is one third part which is coming out we should care up for that like uh, dip in the system the uh, lot many things will be connected to the electrical equipment and the grid is becoming smart but uh, there will be uh, opportunity for the industry for the equipment manufacturer to control the dip momentarily you don't have to rely on the grid that are the smart v to g like in electric mobility we are talking uh, about the charging of the electric mobility simultaneously we are talking about uh, controlling the dip from vehicle to grid so that kind of opportunities are there which will be coming down the line in next uh, coming years and we have to be ready for that so definitely there are a lot of challenges in manufacturing hub for electrical equipment and make in india and atmanirbhar bharat is a driving force for that because atmanirbhar cannot happen without atma chintan and that is what we are doing right now so with that i end my thing okay okay yeah um, again uh, a very very important point i have made there on atmachintan but anyway so our next question is uh, for mr rehman and i want to ask him uh, you know on role of technology so we all know that productivity is an uh, is, a, is a very important challenge that that is faced in uh, the manufacturing sector so how do you see the role of technology in in over, overcoming that challenge of productivity uh you know how can uh, companies use uh, technology as a uh, you know to to address that challenge of productivity when it comes to the manufacturing sector okay uh, so as i earlier talked about uh, it's um, i mean we we have been as uh, itachi we have been you know developing a lot of products pioneering technology and you know, all into market i think today the situation is that it's how do you do that uh, with faster time to market and also with uh, less of cost and uh, here what we do is we uh, of course we have been using this concept of concurrent engineering because we have uh, r and d product development happening in several parts of the world including in india india we have in chennai in bangalore our global r and d center we have r and d centers in uh, in sweden and germany in switzerland in us in china uh, so concurrent engineering what we do is you know uh, specialists they work on different parts of the product or systems together you know, concurrently and also bring in and virtually connect and then try to uh, integrate those technologies then the models the simulation uh, what we do the finite element uh, modeling and multi physics modeling simulation so they sort of concurrently uh, develop so that we are able to squeeze we are able to reduce the time to market uh first of all uh, time to do the prototyping uh, virtual prototyping we do the software uh, simulation kind of prototyping where we also use the 4d model uh, so normally we know that 3d model is the you know where you have the 3d space and you can see the equipment you can see in the system in installation and uh, for example we are now working on this uh, you know the 6000 megawatts of uh, high hpdc uh, link uh, from raiger to kuglur more than 1600 kilometers 6000 megawatts it's so a very important uh, uh, you know uh, element of our grid and where the converter station the you know inverter station both the both the ends they have lot of uh, technologies going in uh, but uh, you know before you get any uh, issues or surprise so what we do is we do the 4d modeling where we 3d uh, rendering we do of all the products and the systems and also the 4d the fourth one is the time dimension so today if you are we are planning uh, 
uh, for a system to be uh, sort of installed in some location so we create the 3d as well as 4d that how well, let's say next two years how this project is going to come up how the equipment how the product they will be integrated and you can have the complete uh, experience of that you can see okay this is you know somewhere you have to you need some kind of uh, correction in terms of uh, integration engineering commissioning installation so you see also some of the issues uh, early enough so that you can correct uh, we do the piloting also uh, in terms of uh, uh, concurrently not only you know just uh, doing it in the lab and then bringing it to the site but we parallelly do piloting in the in the installation at the site and then so using all these uh, different technologies of multi physics modeling simulation finite element and of 4d uh, i talked about you know the virtual reality augmented reality also we bring in so we call it power twin so where all these elements are uh, sort of integrated all the technologies and then you see uh, you can experience the entire uh, product functionality and also its integration in the system like a hvdc installation you can see the converter station inverter station and also the control room the valve room everything you can actually uh, see even before it comes up so that you can uh, reduce the time which otherwise no no sometimes takes uh, because of the issues at site issues in the installation so i think that is how we are improving using the technology the automation technology the digital technology the virtual technology the 4d the modeling technology and simulation yeah okay yeah thanks mr raman um, my next question is for mr mishra here and uh, it's related to uh, regulatory approval right uh, what are the kind of challenges that are typically faced um, uh, you know in meeting the regulatory and uh, safety standards uh, as far as the electrical and electronics equipment space is concerned yeah. uh, truly now uh, we are yet to uh, really face anything in actual field the population is very very less now i mean in my sector till now the ch challenges is uh, how it will work i mean when you go for a say electrical vehicle or electrical uh, driven system in uh, on road or in mines safety is uh, safety of equipment is a one issue but safety of the entire system or the people how you feel when something fails due to connectivity or due to uh, charging issue on a main road see your going through a uh, some uh, terrain and you, you your connectivity or your uh, charges goes up if it is a heavy vehicle how you feel so our regulatory system has to first insist that whatever promise the producers or the equipment builders are giving on their uh, advertisement or their in a product portfolio they are matching at least up to some uh, 90% or 85% and if it is not done then what type of uh, control they have recently there are some legal issues uh, put forwarded by the end consumer against tatas the tatas uh, this electrical vehicle they were telling per charge you should move say 300 km but there are so many conditions which are in fine prints most of the end user they don't have any idea what are those they feel that if i charge the uh, my battery it should go 300 km but they don't know what type of speed or what type of other combinations are there so these things slowly will come it is yet to come because it is still uh, in india it is a something like a uh, innovative product it is not a regular product that migration will take some time and as i told basically psychologically we are we stick to the past very regularly that old was might be more shining than the current one which is actually not correct we actually not correct but for that to uh, migrating to the new systems and new things uh, it will take some time but regulatory uh, bodies they, they themselves should know what they are targeting because they, they themselves are not updated in many cases they are talking about some laws which are may not be applicable today so when you tell that there is no registration required in electrical vehicle up to certain range what it means is the driver is anybody can drive perhaps no what about the other uh, say road senses or those training so those are has to be in uh, line with the actual uh, issues I think it will take some time, but regulatory bodies, as, as of now, they are uh, 
they are in a cross finger situation they are themselves are not very clear because these things are still in laboratory to road laboratory to field stage it will take some time but so you are basically changing. saying that there has to be better understanding of you are basically yeah. saying that there has to be better understanding of of the on ground issues exactly. exactly. uh, very important point there uh, again uh, by mr mishra uh, let me ask uh, mr sharma here um, a question um, on disruptions in technology right and uh, so so uh, you know we know that it's a uh, uh, the current disruptions that are happening in the technological space right digitization iot etc it's a very important challenge for the entire electrical and electronic equipment sector or the industry uh, how should one adopt with these challenges it's a very broad question but if you can answer that for us yeah yeah uh, so when we talk about disruption in technology i could say we are on the verge of disruption already the disruption has started uh, pandemic in the pandemic period uh, something got preponed some type of disruption like we have seen online classes education got converted to online even the uh, healthcare aragya setu app lot of uh, now uh, vaccination program is going on so look at uh, the moment the person is vaccinated you get the information on your mobile the data the big data everything is well documented now so uh, something got preponed the distributor so basically uh, there are three six sectors which will face this disruption number one heading is energy storage number 2 healthcare number 3 transportation number 4 agriculture number 5 uh, manufacturing and number 6 uh, education so already it has started into that now when we say disruption like long back uh, we were talking about uh, iot internet of things and parallelly we were talking about the operational technologies Uh, and uh, like we say india is very good at jugad jugad technology which uh, respectfully we call it as a hybrid technology so uh, everywhere there are things are getting hybridized like uh, it is converging technology like we when we say uh, uh, it information technology converging with uh, operational technology so we are getting the something different which is we call it as iot iiot so uh, this all things converging into each other why they are converging we first we need to understand that because every technology is driven by consumer a user experience and uh, there are a number of users geographically geographically one thing may not be acceptable in one area but other way area it will be acceptable so it is a collective thing put together and for benefit of user experience things are aligned in such a way to satisfy the user to give him satisfaction and that experience now to elaborate more on those things user experience or uh, iot part uh, what we are doing like the simple question with me if i ask somebody are you satisfied with your mobile everybody will say okay i am having a very good processor i am having this that everything but when it comes to energy storage he is not happy so uh, there is a lag somewhere and now how to compensate with this lag by the time the new technology comes but uh, it is our duty to compensate with that lag this lag is compensated by dms this is compensated by electronics this is compensated compensated by lot of jugglers which we are carrying out and that is a conversion there are technologies which are going to coexist people should not understand one thing okay the new technology has come the older one is going to phase out definitely the phase out process have started the numbering the sequential part will be the technologies which are not green they will be phased out but the technologies which are green but which are not able to cope up are converging like uh, we are into super capacitors we we are into batteries when we talk about super capacitor people ask us very question so now batteries are going i say no 
all these technologies are going to coexist and you have to do better management this better management can be done at the uh, into equipment level at the internet level at the iiot level at uh, taking out best of both the world that is a disruption which will be happening so we have to focus on that yeah. not on so i think that's a, that's a very very important point again made by you you know people have to understand that you know that that change uh, has is you know from one technology to another is is phased Correct. right it has there is a convergence and that is happening and that, has that is a convergence and right. there will be a coexistence so when we talk about the adoption of any technology like uh, government is saying we want to put up a 500 gigawatt for example uh, one plant for lithium battery we would rather say put 500 plant of one gigawatt that will give opportunities to small industry the their success rate will go up because if one plant either it will be successful or not but in 500 numbers of smaller smaller part there will be a 50% ch chance there will be a 60% chance so that kind of thing we have to focus on supply chain we have to as somebody rightly said on compliance because when new technologies are coming we are not ready with the compliance so government bodies has to come up with the compliance part to support the industries and definitely small industries are the driving force of our country unlike the other countries we have to focus more on small industries and that is where uh, adoption is very important and these are the challenges we have to yeah. face and thank you yeah. thanks thanks uh, thank for you. those for the insightful comment uh, let me ask Mr. Rahman, uh, you know, something which is uh, a, a question on, on a COVID, uh, uh, you know, scenario, basically something which is being faced by all the companies. So how do you, how do you manage to continue product development activities, right, during uh, a crisis like COVID? Uh, and in the past uh, one year of that experience, for example, what have been the key learnings that have emerged from that uh, entire episode? If you can share that with our viewers. Sure. Uh, I think uh, uh, many ways of uh, doing the product development r and we have been doing, you know, in a, in a conventional, traditional way. But uh, during COVID, because of the adversity, because of the situation, we managed, we also learned to be a more role-based kind of working. Uh, so in the product development R&D, for example, there are people who do the simulation, modeling simulation, you know, they can uh, do it uh, sitting in the office, in the lab, or maybe at home also. Uh, so that we ensured that, okay, people who can actually uh, do the modeling simulation design and also connect with their peers across the world, they can, you know, do it from home from remotely. And people who are required to be in the lab because you cannot shift the equipment or uh, test equipment from the lab to home or elsewhere. So then they they can be in the lab. And also many a times we do the piloting. I talked about uh, some people they have to be at site. Uh, not uh, everybody earlier used to be that you know big team of people will go to the site and also do this. But we ensure that okay uh, maybe only people who are required at site to do the physical the the you know uh, the physical installation commissioning at the same time we use this technology of uh, connecting remotely with experts and we have done that actually many examples we had uh, we, we we are installing uh, asset management asset performance management with lot of sensors in our equipment uh, it's a new project where uh, our engineer they were at site but they could connect uh, to for example us canada our experts there who are experts in the sensor in the in the computation in the AI ML. So they could configure, they could work together. At the same time, in our lab, we are doing, we did some simulation, they also connected to that. We also used a lot of uh, remote uh, uh, factory acceptance tests uh, for a lot of equipment, whether it is type test or routine test that we did remotely, including our uh, customers, uh, they could join remotely. It is not about just sharing the screen, it is also about how they can see the entire testing process, the real-time data coming out of the test equipment, coming out of the, you know, then also have digital sign-off. Uh, so it's it's more intelligent rather than uh, just sharing the screen and looking, you know, facing each other and talking. It's also about uh, really getting into the display of the test equipment, what kind of data, whether it's a switching equipment, the, the timing, opening time, closing time, 
and then see how physical it is happening in the lab and also at the same time the screen where it is you know showing the the timing in real time so all these things we could do uh, i think uh, we had all these uh, technology earlier also like remote uh, remote monitoring remote engineering uh, but we, as I said, role-based, we, we sort of use that approach, role-based kind of uh, managing the situation, uh, whether it's R&D, product development, or piloting at site. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, nice comments again there. Uh, my my last question for this panel discussion is for uh, Mr. Shital Kumar Joshi. And, uh, you know, it's related to the larger roadmap uh, going ahead of what we are talking about here. So you have listened to all of the, you have heard the panelists talk about different kind of challenges here, uh, you know, whether it is regulatory, technological, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what is the larger roadmap that you recommend to, to address these challenges very broadly? Yes, uh, uh, I think it's uh, what I what I feel over here and uh, one of the panelists mentioned, I think Mr. Rajendra uh, mentioned that it should it's important from R2, P or C, or that, that research to go into the field uh, for the product. So, so for that overall, as an engineering simulation provider, you know, I would always be proponent of taking more virtual methods and bringing front loading the design and development and verification validation. Yeah, so most kind of industry, power industry applications are now reasonably well understood by physics based methods. You know, combination of structural, thermal, electrical methods have helped people to reduce uh, development cost by considerable time, I think Amit Agarwal also mentioned before, and something interesting what uh, Mr. Rahman mentioned about 4D uh, models. So, so, so I think that's that's important. We need to add more of a rigorous analytical methods on top of it. Uh, another part is on the virtualization is the virtual functional verification should be done on system level more and more, and how you can make more virtual functional verification accurate by taking the component level model integrated into the virtual system. I think that's a newer methods and trends that we are seeing, and I think that would make virtual system and functional verification much more accurate. And uh, when we go on the digital infrastructure specifically, I feel that I think there should be, we should not rely only on analytics. I think analytics plays a major part of it, but there should be a marriage between analytics and physics. You know, combination of machine learning coupled with physics, that would enable how product performance as well as, you know, product uh, health uh, more accurately than doing only with analytics. I think that, that this will help with uh, prognostic, diagnostic, and prescriptive kind of uh, management of equipment as well as process. And and and, and, and last, uh, I would say, I think we, uh, while we are quite uh, aggressively going on virtualization and digitization, I think guard should not be uh, left uh, uh, left down for the safety. All, uh, uh, all the circuit breakers specifically, I think those are the, uh, very, very complex and, uh, and then we need to have a Good safety. So now I see uh, physics and computational methods have advanced considerably, Raj, where you can integrate plasma physics and and, and, and quite accurately predict uh, the safety of a particular uh, a particular equipment. So I think that's that's the broadly uh, uh, my my thoughts uh, about about how we tackle these challenges more from the virtualization point. Thank you, uh, Mr. Joshi, for those uh, uh, comments. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to an end of this entire discussion. A uh, very thought-provoking and uh, very insightful discussion it has been, where we have talked about a lot of really important things within the larger electrical uh, and equipment industry. Uh, we've talked about R&D challenges, we've talked about innovation, we've talked about uh, even um, the challenges that typically come up in technology and manufacturing and even uh, regulatory approvals, etc. Uh, so that uh, brings us to an end. Uh, thank you, uh, panelists, for your time. Uh, please carry on and look forward to hosting you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sudhir. Thank you. Thank you, all. thank you panelists, for imp uh, imparting such valuable takeaways. Uh, moving on now, we have a panel discussion on simulation-driven product development to accelerate design, development, and reducing time to market for electrical equipment. And for this, I would like to invite Mukesh Agarwal, Senior Program Manager, Emerson Innovation Center, to moderate this discussion. Over to you, Mr. Agarwal. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Annie. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Guys, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, thank you, Annie. You. Yeah, uh, thanks, Siti, for this. 
Uh, I would like to invite all the panelists for this discussion. Uh, our today's topic is uh, simulation driven product development for electric equipment. So let's start with Mr. Gundu Sabde. Uh, he's director, Sealif Technologies. Uh, Mr. Vinay Patwardhan, uh, Deputy General Manager, Bharat Bijli, having more than 20 years of experience in motor industry. Mr. Elton Lewis, Director, Ben Electricals, uh, who's into product development and production of electric motors. Mr. Arvind, Senior General Manager, Rotex Automation, with more than 26 years of experience in product design and manufacturing engineering. And uh, Mr. Tushit Desai, more than eight years of experience in automotive and electrical and represents uh, ANSYS as a solutions architect. <clears throat> as I mentioned, our today's objective is to look at the simulation driven product uh, development for electric equipment. Uh, if we see the recent changes in industrial trends, changes in the government's policies, specifically to make uh, India as a manufacturing hub, promote Indian companies, I think it's very important that we become competitive. India becomes competitive. So with this in mind, I would like to start the uh, first question asking Mr. Gundu Sabde. Uh, sir, what is your view on uh, India's investment in design and innovation, especially for electrical and electronics equipment so that we become competitive in global market? <clears throat> so as we see uh, Mr. Sharma and our panel one, there were a lot of discussions which happened in how the India is uh, going through and how many things are happening. What are the challenges in terms of R&D and in manufacturing? Uh, my question to you would be, what is, according to you, the role of R&D uh, in making India as an innovation hub? And uh, if you can add further, uh, what are the design requirement and challenges we face uh, in this sector? Yeah, thank you, Mukesh. Uh, yes, we heard the panel one uh, very nice discussion about R&D. Uh, what I feel is uh, looking at the global level today, India is being looked at very much as a research hub, as a manufacturing hub. And now all other rest of the world is looking at India as a big source, right? And we have a lot of talent in India. We have creativity in India. <laughs> Those things are now to be nurtured through academics as well as the industry. Somewhere uh, some person is developing something, something innovative, but he is not able to bring it to the level where it can be commercialized. So here, I think uh, industry as well as academy uh, institutions can play a big role because the concept assets are being developed. There are many of creative things being done. Now those things are brought to a level where the concept becomes into an implementation stage where I feel the challenges are like infrastructure is not still to be developed we have to go a lot there the automation part where um, some concept is there in mind but we cannot do it without automation manually certain things are not possible so automation support is also required then third one is the manufacturing we uh, came across many things I will give one example let's say if I want to make a motor of 1.5 lakh RPM for uh, some automation industry, but now to prove that prototype, I need a lot of different materials, lot of uh, special steel and all, which uh, I am not able to get to make the prototype. That depends only at the concept level. So such support if uh, we get in India through agencies or through industries, as well as uh, by the research institute, then we'll be able to convert our ideas much faster and we'll be able to offer something good to the society as well as to the world. So that is what I think. Thank you, sir. That's a very, very valid point and thanks for covering all the aspects. Uh, with this in background, I would like to ask Mr. Mr. Elton. Uh, so since we are now talking about simulation and engineering simulation, uh, and with your background, how do you see uh, engineering simulation uh, role in uh, design and development? And does engineering simulation help uh, overcome the challenges of design objectives? Yeah, thanks, Mukesh. Uh, well, to begin with, yeah, I mean, simulation is an extremely vital and plays a very crucial role in product development. Uh, I'm going to break it down into two aspects. 
uh, one would be new product development and the second one would be fine tuning and upgrading of existing products so when you're looking at a new product development using simulation really helps cut down on a lot of investment costs on a lot of the lead time that it takes to actually come up with a new product uh, when you look at fine tuning and upgrading existing products uh, you may have a product that's already out there in the market uh, speaking from a personal point of view and my personal experience uh, we as a company we deal with a lot of original equipment manufacturers where we do supply electric motors. Now, a customer may be happy and may be satisfied with the performance of the product, but there is always that continual pursuit for perfection of a particular product. And when you're looking at uh, a real life product, you have new materials coming into the market, you have new research being done with regards to performance of certain materials. Now, how could you then integrated into your product so simulation helps out in uh, this aspect because your present product is still out there in the market but at your end without any investment without any uh, procurement of raw material and any new tools you can uh, try out the new product you can try out the new materials and as long as it is within that size constraint or within that cost constraint of the customer, uh, you can come up with a better version of your existing product. So it really aids in this continual pursuit for, for perfection in a particular product. Uh, with regards to performance, uh, as uh, Mr. Vinay Patwardhan also touched upon, with uh, regards to a physical product, there's only so much you can obtain uh, in terms of results in terms of the data uh, if you are looking to obtain each and every parameter performance parameter you would need a huge investment in testing equipment in state of the art facilities which is simply not possible at a practical level uh, this is where simulation comes in because when i look at my motor i could look at a hundred different parameters and look at the effects on those hundred different parameters and i can take a informed decision uh, whereas when you don't have simulation what you're looking at is uh, obviously you're looking at a particular set of data but that's limited then you have to rely on your instinct whereas simulation really gives you this in-depth data which you could then use to analyze and better your product so uh, all of this i mean all of this put together whatever i've spoken about simulation really helps you uh, develop all of these and improve all of these aspects without having a major impact on your regular production and uh, you could do it simultaneously in the background so your product flow is not affected at all uh, so yeah it's a huge saving in cost a huge saving in time and uh, i think simulation is here to stay in the future as well when it comes to product development and product improvement Oh, that's great uh, insight again, uh, Mr. Elton. And that's a very valid point where you said that uh, simulation helps and it runs parallel. So it's not affecting the workflow. Uh, and I have also heard people saying that uh, you can isolate the impact of a particular physics, which we cannot do during uh, physical testing. So that's another advantage. Uh, thanks for that insight. Uh, moving on to Mr. Arvind. I mean, since we have understood what the simulation and how the R&D plays a role, then another important factor which comes about is regulatory. I mean, uh, do you think simulation helps in uh, achieving the regulatory standards like, say, for example, star rating, energy efficiency, and uh, something certainly related to safety? I mean, what are the best practices so that we can achieve these objectives? Yeah, thank you, Mukesh. Uh, this is uh, very interesting uh, having been worked in uh, engineering for uh, more than 26 years. Uh, I have seen personally how the simulation uh, technology has evolved over the years. Uh, initially, when we started, it was all hand calculations or you go to an expert uh, to do manual calculations to see if your uh, product is safe or uh, doing the required uh, performance. But over the years, we have seen uh, so many softwares, uh, simulation softwares coming up uh, in all fields, whether it is mechanical, electrical, uh, aeronautics, automotive, or even process industry equipment. So 
I, I'm a strong believer of using simulation and it has really helped uh, me and the companies where I work to reduce the lead time uh, of product development, what you call uh, time to market, you know, to a very great extent, um, at least three to four times faster minimum. And uh, coming to this regulations and others of your specific question, I would say uh, today we have so many options of simulation uh, softwares that uh, we have already, I have personally used, I cannot name the name of the companies where I've used it, but I can tell you that uh, in pumps, uh, let us say, uh, you measure efficiency by output, which is flow and pressure uh, with respect to energy that you give into the pump, water pump basically. That's one of the highest consumers yeah. of uh, electricity in the world. So you divide output by um, input to get your efficiency. And uh, there are ways to optimize the design right from concept stage, like impeller profile uh, of the pump, and then the casing profile, and a combination of that. There are softwares to simulate that yeah. upfront, even, even before you put meat on the surface, it's just at surface level. Then you do, you generate the performance curve of the pump through simulation, uh, head versus flow. And then uh, you can build prototypes, you can optimize a great extent and uh, you can um, build prototype with the best version that you have and then correlate the actual results with the output. And we have reached up to like 95, 97% accuracy with respect to actual results and simulation results. So it comes over a period of time, we started with 90 or 85, I would say. And before that, uh, another pump, which was small pump, fuel pump in a different company. Uh, there the accuracy of simulation to uh, product, actual prototype test was 98 to 99%. So that was really accurate and uh, Extending that, you can predict what would be the star rating of the product. And coming to solenoid valves, uh, where I'm currently working, the energy efficiency is uh, nothing but the force generated by the solenoid for a given current input. So for a given current input, if you can generate more force, then your solenoid valve is more efficient. And there are softwares today where you can easily simulate the uh, performance of a solenoid while itself while with current versus force current versus the response time and things like that uh, so it's it's easy to optimize the uh, parameters of the solenoid design like uh, whether it is resistance of the coil or uh, the energizer uh, which helps uh, generate the emf uh, and then uh, there is a stopper uh, which stops the solenoid plunger from moving further so the profile of that and the plunger itself, the mating profile with the uh, stopper, uh, the diameter, the clearances and air gaps uh, and the coil winding parameters itself, like how closely they are wound and how tightly they are wound, uh, how many layers, uh, the quality of the wire. So there are so many things which you can optimize upfront and arrive at uh, a particular performance level which you are confident of uh, and then go for prototyping. In my experience, I would say we will save at least four to five iterations and each iteration you can say around one to two months. So that's the kind of uh, thing you can do. And you can predict star ratings as you said and then test it and get it certified. That will help you go to the market faster with best ratings that you have. Uh, and then I would say best practice to get this is have some back of the envelope calculations as they say, like do some basic uh, engineering calculations. We're all engineers, right? So do some basic <laughs> calculation and see where the trend is. Like as you're right rating, it is very important as a product design engineer to see where this analysis is going. Otherwise, an FE engineer can take you and drop you in a desert at the end of the day. So you have to figure out, okay, where we are going and then uh, guide uh, because the, the way you set the, it all depends on how well you set the boundary conditions, how well you understand the loads that are acting 
on your particular product the working environment what are the loads generated by the environment and the working uh, phenomenon and then provide them as inputs loading conditions in the software that is a skill by itself how you define how do you translate your operating requirements and environment requirements to analysis input loading itself is a skill comes by experience you will start somewhere and as you fine tune it you will improve better that is one part and the second part is what kind of mesh uh, size do you use what kind of mesh type you use uh, at what cross section or the feature of the product so there are things like this which are uh, nitty gritties of uh, analysis so the more you do and more you correlate with practical much better is your next simulation so this is a journey yeah this is a journey uh, and it's not like you start and you got it so it's a journey you have to be passionate about it and you have to be serious about it to achieve uh, any reasonable result otherwise you try a couple of times and say okay simulation doesn't help so okay. in order to avoid that you have to be a little bit more uh, stringent and uh, working through the process that's what i was saying right yeah and that's very well said again that the result should be physical so that we do hand calculation to make sure that our analysis is in right direction uh, with that uh, uh, we have uh, gundu sir online uh, sir i would like to ask one question to you uh, before i go to tushit uh, so what is your uh, view of uh, india's investment i mean we want to become uh, globally competitive that's what india is and government is focusing on so what is your view on india's investment in um, design and innovation for this sector that is electrical and electronics so that india becomes competitive in global market so um, with all the uh, initiatives that are out there trying to promote indian manufacturing at the end in my opinion uh, this would uh, happen uh with strong innovation backing uh innovation will help to uh improve the product range uh the product performance as well as reduce the cost there are multiple examples where we have been able to achieve this we are bldc motor manufacturer and uh, uh, power electronics the drivers for this bldc motors Uh, we believe that our current cost is quite competitive with the uh, uh, the overseas uh, overseas suppliers who have dominated um, uh, BLDC motor supply in India, and uh, this has happened through uh, continuous improvement in designs and uh, reduction in material usage. You see, you can save cost in various ways, but if you are uh, uh, reducing the material usage that cost reduction becomes very significant and uh, we found number of opportunities in that for example the uh, commodity prices have gone up the the magnet prices rare earths have increased so much like uh, i think they are uh, 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 there is more than 100% increase in the magnet prices in last one year however in the products we are making today have less than 50% magnet content while the performance is either enhanced or it is at least equivalent so at the end our magnet cost has remained flat or slightly reduced on per motor basis so um, i i have worked in r&d for 20 years around uh, in, in multinationals uh, mostly in united states area and uh, 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 it's the uh, it's the these uh, these innovations that leads to uh, much significant uh, cost reductions compared to anything else and i think um, yeah, india has to focus that for that we are utilizing uh, university industry relations to our advantage and uh, this has to be done in a very skillful manner because expertise is available at uh, uh, um, uh, at some of the major institutes i say around 20 institutes are there in india where 
there are, there is expertise available but there is lot of hand holding required to materialize that into product or useful to the industry it also requires patience and spending time with them and uh, we need to capture their knowledge and utilize that engineering and optimization we have to do it ourselves at the end but uh, some core expertise lies there and that has been very useful okay. to us uh, working with uh, iit guwahati and iit bombay college of engineering in pune uh, uh, we uh, that that was helpful to us okay great uh, thanks for that uh, insight i would like to uh, go to tushit now uh tushit what do you think uh, adoption uh, i mean why do you think adoption of simulation is essential for this sector thanks mukesh for asking this question uh, first of all um, talking broadly about electrical and electronics equipment so they are a true multi physics problem so it is not just you know we are dealing with one physics um, there are multiple physics involved electromagnetics thermal structural aspects and all and uh, one needs to have a precise attribute balancing across the physics to you know have a robust product design um vinay sir just talked about the different challenges and then mr arvin talks about a little bit on the uh, regular like, regulatory aspects uh, mr rehman mm -hmm. talked about uh, cyber security side and functional safety side which is very important nowadays uh, iso 61508 and 21434 uh, how do you you know so so to get to get into those uh, you know the to 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 bound the problem and to design the product within those uh, regulatory standards with the star ratings and you know energy efficiency specifically for induction machines uh, ie standards and all uh, there are a lot of r and d effort goes inside and this this is not just simple it comes with a lot of cost uh, so so nowadays the trend is to move more towards the virtual prototyping than uh, getting into the physical product development physical proto at the early stage of the product development so once the i would say the simulation method is established uh, we can do a hundred and thousands of iterations uh, study the what if scenarios uh, define our objectives within the constraint and see that how we can get the best possible design within the design space uh, virtually so once the methodology is established and once you get the you know the outcome what you are looking for through the virtual simulation and then you get into the final physical proto uh, that will you know basically uh, compress the overall development cycle and saves lot of cost uh, if you if you just talk about the design aspects some of the things like you know uh, specifically for electrical and electronics equipment uh, we do a light weighting through electromagnetic simulations the efficiency improvement is uh, you know always done through the uh, thermal simulations and cooling circuit design uh, we also look at the you know um, the structural integrity uh, avoiding the uh, noise and vibration aspects and all that's where the nvh part and all comes uh, these are the you know very basic simulation methods on the advanced side you know uh, the different companies uses the, the multi core multi hpc approaches to do the extensive level of you know the optimizations and the iterations uh, let us stand you know we as an ansys working on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning side um where you know we try to develop the methodology uh, how you know we can uh, we can design the optimum products within the less number of iterations through simulation so that this will also help in compressing the overall development cycle so overall if you see this all methodologies will you know help in replicating the uh, physical world problems uh, uh, on the virtual platform uh, this will also help in detecting all the issues whatever you face on the you know uh, on the physical products early in the the product development side and that will you know help in you know compressing the uh, overall development uh, chain or the process or timeline which goes so that's how you know the general the simulation would help in you know um, uh, looking at and designing the robust product developments within the uh, regulatory aspects right so with all the uh, all the points which you mentioned uh, basically and also to connect with what mr elton said basically it helps uh, get to the market faster uh with all the points which you mentioned i think that's the most and biggest advantage of uh, simulation so moving on to uh, mr uh, vinay uh how has simulation uh, given a competitive advantage to your organization uh, uh 
for motor design uh, we use lot of simulation i would say we are having lot of concepts and we don't know which concept to take forward for any uh, mm -hmm. particular design we extensively use simulation though it uh, electromagnetic design or mechanical design or mechanical structural analysis before we decide on to what is the final product or prototype which we want to make so what we do is uh, in the new product development cycle our major step is simulation we check lot of options uh, before finalizing any design let's say for a permanent motor we are using uh, at bharat bijli for uh, mainly for lifts so these pmsa motors are very cost sensitive because the magnet prices are very high as mr kundu said so we are highly dependent on the rare earth magnet so now the big question is how to optimize my motor and then offer it to the market now when i can uh, do that only i have to rely on simulation so i have different different options different slot pool combinations we try we compare the material prices we compare the material weights and then finally come to a conclusion that out of let's say 10 to 15 options we shortlist around three options after we get the simulation results and these three concepts which we shortlisted one or two we go ahead for the prototype so assume if we don't have the simulation uh, backup we cannot uh, make all the uh, a concept which we decided into a prototype that will uh, call for a huge investment so here uh, simulation plays a very important role for us and then we decide based on that backup uh, knowledge we develop the methodology first uh, when we started uh, long back let's say 50 60 years back at that time we were making only hand calculations and we were making prototypes then arrive at the results compare what was the theory and what is the practical results then compare uh, those things Today we have reached a uh, level where Mr. Arvind also mentioned up to 95% accurate results we are getting from uh, analysis to the actual uh, prototype test results. So now we have confidence that whatever we decide and we go for manufacturing, it will work best up to 95 to 98%. So that methodology we are now established by using this uh, simulation software. So that will give us. an edge when we try to enter into the market with some new enquiry which we get that enquiry to the uh, product or the offering of first sample we are now able to achieve less than 2 months to 3 months which was earlier 6 months to 1 year time so that is what uh, the edge we are getting into the market then customer also is happy okay today we got the enquiry and then within 2 months or within 1 and 1/2 months somebody is able to get the sample for testing so that gives him a good confidence that yes this company is able to offer uh, quick solutions that is what is the important uh, help which we are getting through the simulation software right so not only faster time to market but you also could uh, pitch in and grab some business which in general circumstances would have gone to some of your competition so that's really another yes, great yes. advantage of using simulation uh, uh mr elton uh, with that in mind uh, what i would like to know from you is uh, how simulation can help in uh, i mean uh, obviously to some extent uh, arvind and mr vinay has covered so on similar lines how simulation can help in reducing physical prototype i mean uh, have you done or do you have experience of how possible it is to accelerate innovation and reduce cost yeah thanks bukesh uh well i mean most of my points to be very honest here are points that have already been covered by vinay and uh, mr gundu and uh, tushit as well i guess we are all in a similar space uh yeah so basically <laughs> as i said you know earlier simulation is a very vital tool when it comes to product development uh traditionally i mean i'm a young person but my company was started somewhere in the 80s if we go back then and we look at how prototyping was done and how development was done as mr vinay had put across it was mainly through on paper calculations and building prototypes and then taking it forward from there now one of the problem with that methodology is your prototyping options uh you can't prototype all your possible options out there it's just not feasible especially when you're working see when you're working in a research industry 
and you have funding it may be doable okay but when you're working in uh, the production industry where you are delivering real time to customers you can afford to have such a large outlay on your prototyping so what simulation does in today's world is it helps you cut down on a lot of your possible options now when it comes to motor design there isn't one correct solution or there isn't one correct way of doing it. there are n number of ways you could achieve a particular target that is required by the customer so simulation helps you reach the end stages of your prototype you could then look at choosing a few options and fine tuning them further whereas in the past you would have to look at a single option and physically obtain the results physically obtain data and then take it forward today we can look at so many possible options in physical pro in uh, simulation and really save the number of physical prototypes that are required uh, when we look 20 years ago you would probably have about 5 to 6 prototypes at least before you take your product to the market in today's world you could have two and these two are way more capable of your you know your sixth product that was 20 years ago it's because simulation gives you so much flexibility it saves time it saves cost every physical prototype that you develop there's a huge cost constraint uh you know when you're looking at a bulk production it's fine because material is ready available you can't invest tons of material for one particular product that is going to consume probably 10 kilograms of that particular raw product what do you do then with the rest so it helps eliminate a lot of uh, you know wastage of material and at the end of the day when you are working in a manufacturing sector a lot of the products are a lot of the projects are time sensitive you may you may have to take you know 6 months to reaching the best product your best output but you don't often have those 6 months you have to do it within the space of 2 months as when mr vinayan mentioned so in these cases it's a huge boon because you could reach your final product you could deliver the product in a time frame where previously your first prototype perhaps wouldn't even come out so it helps save a lot of time it uh, helps save cost because there are number of physical prototypes that significantly reduced and uh, within our industry that is the major major uh, advantage that you have when it comes to simulation great uh, th- thanks elton uh, yeah. so uh, i'll go to mr arvin i mean uh, we see many warranty claims uh, coming into picture when we are into production and manufacturing so how does simulation help in uh, addressing the field failures and uh, the whole objective is to reduce the warranty claims so so far what we discussed is on how do we have a new product reach faster to the market but then what about once it's in the market about warranty claims okay so warranty claims is a different ball game altogether uh there are many factors uh, involved in it one is uh, factors which you can control and uh, factors which you cannot control in the field right so there is something called uh, normal use of a product and abuse of a product we call it so first is to figure out whether the product was used properly or was it abused so you have to start from there start eliminating lot of stuff because you just get into you start using simulation you don't know what to deal with or what to put as an input so i would say start with whether it was used or abused if it is abused to figure out educate the customer how to use it properly and then uh, if it was properly used then uh, we should uh, try to gather the operating conditions uh, where it was put to use and also environmental conditions uh, whether that will help you to understand with your simulation and test results and also do dimensional analysis material test analysis of the failed product so basically you have to do an ad analysis uh, of any such warranty or field problems and go through the eight disciplines to arrive at it and as a part of fishbone or uh, what you call eskava diagram you have to look at all the five ms parameters man machine uh, manufacturing 
processes and uh, money and everything and try to arrive at potential root causes then verify them uh, through some testing or simulation and then finalize the root cause then you can see how to correct it and prevent it in the future so it, it's a, a laborious process to deal with warranty and uh, the biggest challenge is to get the conditions in which it was working so if you get that you can go back to your simulation and then implement those parameters to see whether you can simulate that's a failure today you can predict a lot of failures uh, through simulation so if you can predict or get anywhere closer to that failure mode then it becomes easy for you to explain why this happened and where you missed right whether you missed that working condition or operating condition in your simulation upfront so then you can make changes to your product if required otherwise if it was like rated for minus 30 and plus 130 degrees centigrade as a product and you put that in use in russia or canada where uh, the temperature the ambient is minus 40 degrees or 50 degrees sometimes then it is bound to fail so that, that is where but they will not tell you where it went and where it, they just come back and say this failed uh, and then if it is yeah. fuel or if you are dealing with media then it could be contamination uh, in the fuel or the media that you are using water or air moisture in the air so many other parameters so uh, i think the biggest challenge or the area to focus is to get the actual conditions in which it was working and try to simulate it in the simulation and then arrive at the root cause and fix it now that's how i would look at it Wow, thanks, uh, thanks, Arvind, on that. Uh, so, Mr. Gundu, uh, if we see many new methodologies, new technologies are coming, uh, like automation, digitalization, and there are many advancement in material. So, uh, what is your opinion? How are uh, electrical and electronic sector addressing these challenges? Oh. Uh... Uh, these uh, these methodologies are expected to help us in fact the only thing is uh, we have to be watchful of some of the uh, outdated designs uh, because uh, uh, the, for example the integrated circuits or uh, any of these devices uh, 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 obviously uh, there is a continuous improvement uh, happening that uh, that field moves at a very fast pace and uh, the risk of components getting outdated is high there. But uh, uh, generally, if you have continuous R&D, uh, then it is, it is actually helpful rather than being a problem. So uh, uh, that's what I would say that these, these improvements uh, need to be grabbed and uh, incorporated. There is hardly any product where you you can expect that without change it will run fine for uh, three four uh, i mean uh, the, the business will continue for three four five years uh, you will you will have to improve probably uh, and launch uh, new versions at least every two years uh, uh, especially uh, with the improvements that are happening in semiconductors okay great Great. So yes, that we have to utilize these new methodologies for our existing product development. Uh, Mr. Tushit, I mean, uh, and actually, you would benefit from it in general. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you benefit from it. Uh, you basically can study what has happened in the past and do some automation in future, and probably what we are doing uh, as a faster time to market. As you rightly mentioned, we might be further faster to it. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, yeah. So, Mr. Tushit, uh, what are the initiatives and offerings uh, in this sector uh, for adapting the simulation? I mean, for those companies which are, let's say, startup. Okay. So, uh, talking about the ANSYS, uh, so ANSYS does have a startup program uh, which is globally adapted, and you know, a lot of startup companies have you know have enrolled for that. Uh, it is for early stage startups with you know uh, having a limited uh, funding and revenue providing uh, full access to the you know the simulation portfolio 
designed to help and develop you know the technologies uh, very quickly and cost effectively uh, in that case you know the eligible startups you know gain access to the uh, ANSYS simulation solution uh, to build these virtual prototypes which i just talked about where you know they can make the hundreds and thousands of iterations um, uh, during the same time you know it would take to build uh, one physical you know uh, sample proto in it which, which is you know uh, saving a lot of time and of course the cost and uh, um, these startup programs you know uh, provides an access to a full ANSYS product line which is the structural uh, fluids electromagnetics and you know embedded software and controls uh, also you know giving the marketing opportunities a lot of marketing activities also being you know involved along with the, you know, the product line offerings and also provide the full technical support uh, to the to the to the uh, solution adapters uh, to develop the um, best simulation best practices and methodology which can then be you know used uh, uh, at the later stage once the you know the, uh, the products becomes mature uh, side by side with the simulation and they can you know then um, over a period of time they move more towards virtual prototyping then you know relying more on the physical physical based you know physics based physical protos yeah 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 thanks tushit uh, that was my uh, concluding question uh, and I would like to thank all the panelists for sharing your uh, valuable inputs on this topic. Uh, with that, I think I would like to transfer the baton to uh, ET team again. Thank you, all the panelists, for an insightful session. I would now like you to, be, I would request you, the attendees, to provide your feedback through a short two minute survey. Your feedback will help us in planning and delivering great events for advanced technologies. Uh, please release the questions. So the first question is, do you use design modeling tools, CAD, for your product designs and development? Next question is, are you facing any of the following below challenges in your products? How do you design your products in your organization? Would you like ANSYS to contact you to discuss on the simulation requirements? Thanks for attending the survey. Now we have come to the final session of today's summit. We now have a presentation by Vikas Bobade, technical architect and Girish Kalra, design engineer, Secure Meters. Thanks. Thank you, ET team, for giving the opportunity uh, to join this session and ANSYS. Uh, today we will discuss about uh, uh, simulation in product development. So, first of all, I will give uh, very thanks to our panelists one and two. They have discussed simulation opportunity in product development in detail. So, for the give a uh, quick overview about Secure Meter. So, in Secure Meter, we are having a, a variety of product solution and services which we are giving for uh, it starting from the generation of transmission generation generation plants transmission lines substation distribution we also have various product solutions and services to the consumers of industry building and homes we are having many products related to the energy metering and uh, homes automation so this is the our main um, if we see the quick statistic we are having many meters worldwide. We have global presence. Uh, we have five office, uh, offices in various countries, five countries. And uh, we have a large R&D in India and UK and Australia. We also have Sweden um, uh, R&D center and various sales and marketing offices across the globe. So this is just a quick pictures from the various uh, sites of secure meter. Okay. So, spread of simulation in product design. So, we are doing a virtual prototyping concept. So, we have a CAD uh, models, various CAD models from the uh, electronics and mechanical and uh, we are able to do some kind of verification in the uh, uh, in various simulation tools. So we have ANSYS, we have various product from ANSYS, uh, which we are using for uh, 
RF antenna performance uh, measurement, magnetic study of various transducers in energy meter. You all are aware <clears throat> we have CTs and VTs. Uh, also to improve uh, meter design against the tampering. Thermal simulation uh, we are using for the product uh, safety and reliability. We are using simulation tool for various EMC compliance verification. And from the mechanical, we are using it for the structure, mold flow, and optics analysis. So here uh, I'm showcasing the standard uh, process. We have uh, requirement. We need to evaluate various options. Then we are doing the design based on the selected architecture. Then we build some prototype testing, and then finally we launch our product into the market. During this process, I have captured the key challenges, uh, like uh, we need to capture the correct requirement which suits to the uh, available uh, product portfolio and satisfy the market requirement. Then performance of product, of course, the performance is the first. At the, and then we uh, required various, we go through the various uh, certification to privilege market and the product standards, cost effective solution, of course, to run the business rightly, and time to market is the key challenges. So in complete the process of product development, there is huge opportunity to use the simulation. And simulation is actually uh, help us to mitigate the various challenges in the product designs. With the help of simulation, we are able to do a comparative study for the various options. So we have a number of options. We are able to uh, evaluate the performance cost perspective. We are also able to identify the product performance in terms of how much design margin we have from the specification. <clears throat> we can do the various product certification testing, verification like EMIMC, safety, uh, all those we can uh, we are able to perform. And uh, <clears throat> if we know our product performance design, what we have designed and what is it performance. Uh, so we can also evaluate the cost effective solution if we have uh, opportunity to reduce the cost. In totality, we are able to improve time to market by reducing the various prototype testing, main power cost and cost of development at each and every stages by doing the virtual prototype. So coming to the EMIMC solution, which uh, myself, Pikas Bode, which I'm going to present, uh, followed by uh, Girish Karna for the thermal. So I am captured the examples for uh, conducted emission and radiated emission. Uh, for the EMIMC today discussion. So generally in, for our products in secure meter, we need to comply, sorry, we need to comply for the uh, CISPA 22 standard against the sister. So PCB design verification is one part. Then we have, we use various uh, EMC filters uh, to comply to the particular standard. During this process, what uh, if we go uh, compare this with the uh, legacy one? So currently we required a various PCB revisions, product revision here and there to optimize the uh, performance of the product. So with the help of simulation, what we are trying to try to the first time write product design and certification, and we are able to achieve that stuff. Currently we are using SIVO, AEDT, ANSYS electronic circuits, and HFSS for the study structure analysis. For the conducted emission, uh, there are multiple ways. One of the method uh, for the advanced analysis, we have created one uh, conducted emission uh, lab setup for the conducted emission measurement. On the left side, you can see there is a, a standard uh, setup as per the CISPA 22, and we have model the similar kind of setup in uh, HFSS. 
PCB, we have a uh, paired project in SIBU and the uh, circuit in ANSYS electronic desktop and specifically uh, conducted emission is mainly from the SMPS, which more power supply, flyback converter, which we are using generally, which is very effective. And efficiency is also better for the low, lower load products. So we have analyzed those stuff. So most of the cases, C and RE problems are because of high DD, phi DT, and DI by DT. So here I'm showcasing one of the examples uh, where we have uh, PCB layout and uh, because of uh, some or other constraint, uh, there is uh, one layout which is having a, we analyze that particular layout and we observe there is a higher emissions. Then we revise that PCB to optimize those power loops, high dB by dT and dI by dT. And we got very good opportunity to reduce emission by at least 7%, 7 dBA. So this is very good number. So in this way, we are using the simulation tool for optimizing our PCB design before prototyping. And it helps. So on right side, if you can see, there is a practical results and we got a very close match uh, throughout the band of conducted emission. In the same way, uh, I'm showcasing here the one of the case study where uh, we can optimize the parts also. So in circuit, we have uh, we are having a model, CAD model, spice model for the various parts. So uh, by changing the uh, their properties and their values, which may be uh, good for your performance, which may be having a cost-effective solution. So by comparing those parts we can already identify the behavior uh, if, without prototyping. And it is very closely matching with practical also. So it gives us a confidence, yes, simulation, we can use upfront in design to validate our product. Right, now coming to the radiated emission part, it is very uh, good subject. So for radiated emission today, I'm showcasing one of the example related to the uh, communication, emissions because of uh, some of the communication channel. So here we have a BLE and controller module where there is a SP communication and flash memory and controller where we have some communication. So when we see the signature of radiated emission, we got a higher, which uh, shows you the red line on the left of graph. So to identify whether this emissions are from the SPI or UART and followed by from the which line of uh, uh, which, which signal actually contributing more for the radiative emission. So with the help of simulation tool, we can do it very quickly and easily, right? So you can see on the right side, we have dig down to the problem. Okay, the majority of problem is because of the MISO signal of SPI. It is creating the maximum emission and other emissions are comparatively low. So in this way, uh, we can identify the signals, improve our design upfront to and reduce the, so these are the very innovative techniques simulation we can uh, use uh, to reduce the time to market. Right, another example where we can have say, X capacitor, which we generally use in SMPS to reduce the noise. So, <clears throat> also these are very costly um, component also. So we can see whether that uh, solution that part is required or how we can optimize. So on the left side, you can see there is a higher emission and then we put that particular component into our design and emissions goes very low. So this is the, uh, again, graph for the same stuff where we have on the left side some simulation results which are showing we are getting benefit of around uh, 7 dB, 6.5 to 8 dB uh, benefit we are taking. And uh, against that, we have did some, uh, we performed some practical observation also on our product. And we got a uh, similar kind of model. Of course, here, so it is numbers are uh, somewhat lesser than that, but we have good uh, options. So, this is all uh, today uh, for
for the UNC showcasing, we are using simulation with the various opportunities and product design for the actual product design, cost optimization, performance verification, and improving reliability of our product. So now over to the Girish for the next one. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks ET for organizing organizing this uh, ET energy event. Uh, I am showcasing the uh, thermal simulation uh, related uh, case studies here. So this is uh, one of the uh, great opportunity whereby we we can actually see the effect of the means how the simulation tool can actually help us in the design and development and environments. So the, in this case study, we can see there is a, a, a room. Uh, in colder country, there are some radiator used uh, using the hot wire, hot water, and those hot water are actually circulating in the radiator and using the using for the uh, uh, natural convection of the room, so that the room will actually get heater. So in the right side, you can see there is a pump which is pumping the hot wire, hot water from the boiler, and then it is circulating through the radiator. And they, those radiator is actually uh, creating the heat inside the room, and then it is being again fed to the boiler. So the one of the most important part here is the room thermostat, which is actually sensing the temperature of the air, and then it is, it is feeding back it to into the system so that the boiler will decide key how much temperature should be uh, set for the radiator. So this is one of the case study, and in here we can compare. Uh, the two products means uh, which product performance is actually better in this particular environment uh, that we can see. So we have simulated the natural convection uh, environment in the room, how the heat is actually spreading in the room. So you can see in the images, uh, those are the animated uh, images from the ANSYS tool. So the temperature circulation, how the temperature is actually spreading in the room when the radiator is working, those we can see. And along with the velocity, how the air uh, and the uh, air flow is there in the room that we can see. So likewise, we can actually uh, precipitate key how the product will behave when the uh, actual radiator is working in a real environment, real field environment. So, and these are the velocity results around the product where we can see key how the air flow is starting from the radiator. Uh, onto the left side, and when the air reaches to the product, then the air flow is actually toward the downside flow. So the actual sensor performance, lo its location, we can decide by the simulation tool, and how much time the air will take uh, to reach to the final product. That that we can actually decide by using the simulation tool before final product uh, plastic design and the PCB design in sensor location. So those all we can perform, and we have actually take the advantage of these tool for uh, these kind of things. So air behavior we can simulate it, and these are the actually speed uh, speed plots uh, inside the product. So here we can see ki how the air is actually uh, coming inside the product, and uh, what is the best location of the sensor IC, whereby we can place our sensor, and then the air will exit uh, from the right side uh, ducts of the product. So we can decide ki how much hole size uh, should be there. And then the air circulation around the sensor IC, so that we can uh, get the best performance out of the product that we can uh, take take out from the simulation tool. And uh, the good visuals are there, so that we can actually uh, uh, see where are the obstacles. Like in this case, there are some uh, uh, plastic bosses, so those are actually obstructing the air flow, so that we can actually optimize and improve in the final design before the final mold design is taken place in the product. And uh, when we have performed the comparative study for the two different uh, uh, temperature sensor based product, then uh, we have uh, actually plotted in a virtual environment in the same uh, natural convection environment. And here we can see the uh, the blue line, which is the which represent the one of the option design option is actually performing better as compared to the green line, which is the option two design. So uh, by the design modification in a virtual environment, we can actually save a huge amount of force for uh, real prototyping. And the final physical prototyping is having a much uh, improved performance. So in this case, the, the improvement is 1.78 degree, uh, which is a huge in case of the natural convection environment because it is a very slow progressing uh, environment. So generally, the uh, we don't have any uh, 
practically lab for performing this kind of simulation but the simulation tool helps a lot for creating such kind of environment and uh, uh, comparative study of those uh, products can be easily done in this kind of tool and these are the uh, some of the benefit of the simulation in product design like simulation has a huge potential to simulate the complex real world problem as we have seen uh, we have simulated the natural convection and comparative study of the two different uh, design options can be done and we, we are able to perform uh, comparative study of the various design options creating virtual environment for different performance verification product verification gain confidence before certification testing and iteration by simulation or faster reduces multiple physical prototyping and can easily alter material properties and track impact identify cost effective solution of product features and minimize product cost this is one of the important advantage of the simulation tool and at the last overall development cost reduction and improving time to market is the uh, important parameter of the simulation tool which we can achieve uh, in a design this is all from my side thanks thanks again et team for organizing this event thank you gentlemen for an engaging presentation with this we have come to the end of today's summit i would like to thank all of you present here for sparing your time and being with us throughout the summit i would also like to thank our esteemed speakers for the valuable time and inputs i hope you all like this event as much as we enjoyed putting it all together finally my heartfelt gratitude to our powered by partner ensis thank you and wish you all safety and good health in the days to come stay safe